So welcome everybody to today's colloquium. Uh, today we have the pleasure to have Esther Bauman from NIST um, visit us and she's going to tell us about imaging through flames with coherent laser ranging. Esther is currently a senior research associate at NIST in Boulder. She finished her PhD um, in experimental physics at the University of Neuchâtel in Switzerland, uh, working on intersubband transition gallium nitride and aluminum nitride semiconductor quantum wells. At NIST, uh, Esther has been developing uh, fiber optic frequency combs and uh, uh, looking also into their applications, for example, for dual comb spectroscopy. We heard a little bit about that yesterday, uh, actually a lot, <laughs> and that was great. And also for uh, uh, ranging applications. So we're very happy to have you here. Uh, looking forward to your talk. Thanks, Esther. Yeah, thanks, Felipe, for the introduction. And Thanks, everybody, for coming here. Again, my name is Esther Baumann. For people who haven't heard me yet, my accent is from Switzerland. <laughs> and this work was done in Boulder, Colorado. However, it was a collaboration with uh, Denis in Gettysburg. And we got to use some labs at CU Boulder. Those poor people had no clue what they are getting themselves into. So we will see. We want to do some ranging, but we want to do ranging with laser. So I say here LIDAR, which is laser detection and ranging. Doing some um, ranging with lasers gives high resolution, high resolution. We can measure at standoff distances of a couple of meters. Radar will go farther, but meters is still great. And we can see through flames. I will start with a method that can see through flames then show you the coherent laser ranging precision limitations, show the test bed, the impact of flames, then obviously show you some images we took through flames, talk about frame rates and deforming objects, and give you an outlook. We want to have a 3D imager where we can place meters away from an object we want to actually image. Shown here is a full lab at the NIST in Gettysburg and <clears throat> we want to do this even though we have some obstructions, flames. At the NIST in Gettysburg, they look into structural deformation of buildings in the case of fire. That's the motivation of this whole work. So we need to be robust against these flame radiations. We also need to be able to support very low return power. So when we shine laser light here, we want to collect only a few photons coming back. Also, what we need, we need to have a high range in precision. I mentioned here a number of 100 micrometers. And this meters away. We also want to have the capability to image a scene. That might not be this whole building here. We could zoom in, for example, on a um, joint of a, some eye beams. So it can be tens of centimeters or half a meter times half a meter. And we also need to have reasonable fast update rates of our ranging system so that we can measure deformations. So this whole structure might move while it's engulfed in flames. So what measurement approach could we use to actually see through flames and capture a 3D image? Just to capture a 3D image, I list here some methods, for example, structured light. Works very well. You can capture a human talking. However, it needs very well controlled the light environment. I show here a thumbnail. So they project a pattern on the object to be measured. So it doesn't really work in fire. Blue laser triangulation, show the thumbnail up here. We shine the blue laser through a flame and we measure one single point distance works, but not at very great standoff distances, not 10 meters away, for example. Digital holography has been shown to see through flames. However, it came at, in my world, a rather exotic wavelength, 10 microns. They used a 110 watt CO2 laser. So, I mean, if you want to go and search for a person in a fire, that, I mean, it might be the least of the problem if you blind them, but it's not very really safe. We go down a different route we see if coherent laser ranging can actually be robust to the fire spectrum interferences. 
shown here as a teaser, is a piece of chocolate as taken through flames, the image through flames in our lab. Then we also see that we can measure real time, I mean real time, it's not very fast, but enough to capture the formation of the chocolate, as we're going to see later on. We also are sensitive to weak return signals because we have this coherent laser ranging method, we have a local oscillator, so we can boost our signal. In particular, we choose frequency modulated continuous wave uh, laser detection and ranging. It's a mouthful FMCW LADAR. I have a slide here to explain. I don't know how familiar you are with FMCW LADAR. I wasn't at the time years ago how this method works. So we have a laser around 200 terahertz, 1560 nanometers, which is swept in frequency over a certain time. Shown in the cartoon, we apply a voltage to it and what comes out, the light, changes from red to the blue. Then we split the light of this laser into paths. One path, we have a certain aperture, we focus down on a diffusely scattering object, a cactus. And we also have a local oscillate path, shown here in brown. Those two paths have different lengths, so we can measure the time of flight between those different path lengths. And how we usually explain it is, this path here is long, that means the light that's coming back and is collected back into the aperture is still, let's say, at the green frequency. However, our local oscillator path is shorter, so the light here is already at the blue frequency. So when we know how much frequency, optical frequency is swept in a certain time, we can extract the, the delay time or the time of flight. To get a range out of it, we then simply multiply this time of flight by the speed of light in the respective medium over 2. And we can also detect our ranging signal here, even though we have 200 terahertz light, with, let's say, simply off-the-shelf 100 megahertz photodiode. It's a phase measurement, and an optical bead for linear sweep swept laser can look like this. We can take the Fourier transformation of this optical bead signal, and we get something what I call a range spectrum. We have a certain peak here. The range we extract, or the delay time we extract, is the center of mass of this peak. The resolution of the system is linked to the bandwidth. We sweep over optical bandwidth here the terahertz in the system I represent you today, and the resolution also means how close can two individual targets be with respect to each other, and we can still can distinguish them as two targets. So for a one terahertz optical sweep bandwidth, we get a resolution of 150 micrometers. As I say, we can measure multiple refractions simultaneously. That's the big advantage of FMCW radar. So, for example, we could place our system out of harm's way, shelter it against flame radiation behind the screen, and then sim simply time window or range window out the reflections from the target we actually want to map. So, ideally, we want to have this very linear frequency sweep over time. To take 3D pictures, we want to have high bandwidth, gives us high resolution, so we can measure uh, refractions from targets very close together. We also want to have fast acquisition time because we want to measure those deforming objects. That means we need to sleep very fast in frequency. And this is really hard to achieve with a free-running laser. You can apply any well-controlled voltage to a laser. However, what the laser spits out optically is definitely not going to be linear. I mean, it's just inherent to any laser diode. So we can't do that with a free-running laser. The first step of characterizing or linearizing a frequency sweep is to measure the frequency sweep. That can be done with multiple approaches. One is we can have passive components. Some cavity can be a pair cavity, can be an etalon, can be a cell. And then we can measure the sweep rate or the instantaneous frequency of our swept laser um, according with those etalons. However, whatever you put in there, it needs some calibration. I mean, fiber drifts with temperature, I mean, 10 to the minus 5 per degree C. 
So you need some sort of calibration. A second method is to add a second laser, a frequency comb laser. So yes, it adds a little bit of more complication. However, in the end, what we're going to have, we have a direct calibration to an RF standard. And since I'm coming from a lab where we build frequency comb, it's kind of easy for me to build a frequency comb and add a second laser to my system. When I talk about frequency comb, in this specific experiment, we had a free-running frequency comb. If we have been to Fabrizio's talk yesterday, you know this comb can breathe. And also, we did not lock this specific frequency comb laser. And what I show here in the picture here, the advantage also of having this frequency comb laser to measure incidence frequency, you can apply any waveform you want to, to your swept laser. It can be nonlinear. You can measure uh, fast. So here in this we were sweeping the laser frequency in a sinusoidal waveform, and we can easily extract it with our frequency comb. To take a step back, let's look what a frequency comb is. Uh, the heart of a frequency comb is a mode lock laser. So I start here. You might have seen that slide yesterday with a continuous wave laser, certain cavity. You have a mirror here, 100% reflectivity, and you have an output copper mirror, which has a little less than 100% reflectivity, so we get a sinusoidal, we get a wave out of it, a CW laser. When we add a nonlinear element in this cavity, we get a passively mode-locked laser, meaning that all the optical modes supported in this cavity are in phase. So then, in the time domain, they add up with constructive and destructive interferences. And they, short, they form very short time pulses, separate by the repetition rate of the laser. When we now go into the frequency domain, short in time, broad in frequency, it gives us a broad spectral coverage, the frequency comb. And this frequency comb now has those individual comb teeth or comb lines. It's 100,000 of CW lasers, which are all phase coherent. I rather like to look at this frequency comb not like as a comb structure, but as a ruler in frequency. However, if you think of it, if you have a ruler and you look at it, I mean, you have maybe a 30 centimeter ruler and you have the millimeter ticks, you can maybe discern, I don't know, 100 microns with it. With the frequency comb, you can measure any, really any, any frequency between those comb teeth if you beat it against the CW laser. So it's even better than whatever ruler you would have in your lab. In particular, we do it like that. Here we have our frequency comb. This is a frequency comb we build ourselves. It's an old fiber mode locked laser emitting light at 15, 16 nanometers, erbium gain bandwidth. Those comb teeth or tick marks are separated by the repetition rate, which is linked to the cavity length we have. And then we combine the light from this frequency comb with the swept, light, uh, swept laser light. We do some in-phase and quadrature detection, digitize it, and we can then measure the instantaneous frequency of the swept laser against the frequency comb. And the sweep, maximum sweep rate we can measure is linked to the repetition rate, so for a 200 megahertz repetition rate comb, we actually can measure 10,000 terahertz per second, which is 80 nanometers per second. So to give you an overview of the system we built, here we have our ranging system. I don't show everything, but again, this cactus. And then we split off a little bit of light to beat against the comb, do some in-phase quadrature, some, some unwrapping, to actually take the frequency, it's a nice frequency out of it. So here again, we swept this laser in a sinusoidal waveform. And when I fit a sinus to it, I can still get, I mean, over one terahertz, I have deviation in instantaneous frequency of 30 gigahertz. So yeah, we apply the sinusoidal voltage to it, but it's not a sinus, it's not a pure sinus, we have some deviation to it. Up here is a sonogram of the ranging signal. We had multiple, um, reflections in our system. This is why we have this kind of here, one, one reflection and the second reflection. All the measurements we do, we are based on the clock coming from this comb. So everything is time synchronized. We then combine the two signals. 
which are clocked again, as I said, it was just 200 megahertz of the COM. We resample our ranging signal versus the modulation frequency or instantaneous frequency, and then we do an FFT. So this is basically the linearization of our signal. So we do not active linearize the frequency sweep, which you could do. You could measure the frequency, the incidence frequency of the swept laser, and then have a feedback to the laser. Here we don't do that. We measure it and we resample it, which takes care. It's a passive linearization. Then again, we do the Fourier transformation and we get our range spectrum. So the green trace is the passively linearized range spectrum. And we see we have different reflectivities in our system. That one here was some fiber components, that was the main reflections, and that was just the smallest spurious reflection. If I would assume a sinusoidal sweep rate of the swept laser, I would get the gray trace. And you see for smaller reflection, the totally buried in the noise. To zoom in at our bigger reflection, biggest reflection, we look at a full width of half max of this peak. This is the range spectrum. And indeed, yes, it has a full width of half maximum of 150 micrometers. That means this is going for a one terahertz sweep. That means our linearization works perfectly. Otherwise, we would have a distorted broadened range peak. And again, uh, one range measurement is the center of mass of this range spectrum. Um, to give you some overview of the numbers, we work at the ASA wavelengths of 50, 50 nanometers, we are below 10 milliwatts. The update rate of the system, so one laser sweep, is a half a millisecond. We also add some steering optics to it. We have a beam expander, we focus down on the target, and each of those little dots is actually one range measurement, so we have this triangular scan scanning pattern across the target. This is what we got out of it. So we measured the cactus. Um, it's not a, a big cactus as you guys have here. It was a small one, the one that was living in my office, 10 and a half meters away. And we measured a cube of 10 centimeters times 10 centimeters times 10 centimeters. This 3D image took eight minutes. It's one million points. And then uh, the, the colors is, is just some false color imaging to basically show, you know, the range is, is represented by this color scheme. Then we looked at only one arm of the cactus. And we had to move in slightly closer, not because we didn't get enough photons back, but um, you have a certain aperture, it's Gaussian optics, you focus down and you still need to capture, you need the lateral resolution to actually measure those little cacti spikes, which are measured to 75 micrometers. This is why we had to move a little close. We couldn't do it at 10 and a half meters. With some different optics, we could have discerned also the cacti spikes at 10 and a half meters. So the take home message here is, yeah, we can resolve complex shapes of objects with different reflectivity with different CW later. So I mean, vegetation, dirt, ceramic plate, everything is basically imaged the same precision. That brings me to the next topic. What's the precision of our system? And we at NIST, we need to know. So, first of all, everybody always talks about, oh yeah, you have, you have a range in precision. You need to know in R or in C direction, how precise are we? However, if we want to take 3D images, that's not the only thing we care about. If an image deforms to the flame radiation, we need to know how this whole image deforms, and not just how one point on the image moves. So we did the first experiment. I went, I borrowed some really flat, at least I thought in the beginning, really flat iron lapping plate. And I was imaging just half of this plate here. You see it has a little hole in it, what you see here, and I imaged it with my system. And this is what I got out of it. So yeah, that wasn't really flat. And then, you know, at the university in Boulder, we do not do spherical mirrors. They wanted to have something flat. So yeah, that, that wasn't, there was something happening here. And yeah, of course, I mean, we have some steering optics in it. So it has a kind of a radial sc uh, scanning pattern. This is what's happening here. So then you think, yeah, that's kind of easy. It's just some geometrical distortion. You know, it's a, it's a transformation between R, theta, and phi to X, Y, and C. Kinda, but not really. So then we had to calibrate the scanning pattern of our mirror. We did that basically by placing a indium gallium arsenide camera in the beam path and we're creating a lookup table. 
doing that and then taking a cross-section across here, be before we had this blue curve, now we have the green curve. So, yes, the surface is actually flat to less than 7 microns. So that was a good start. But then now let's have a second look at the green curve or green line I just showed you. Yeah, it has some fuss on it, but also it has those really big outliers. So that one took us a little longer to figure out. So we had to scratch our head a little longer. I thought, yeah, I mean, we know it's flat, that, uh, that polishing plate. So what's happening here? And then we kind of rediscovered speckles. So, I mean, as we all know, you illuminate a rough surface with coherent light. You do not resolve the rough surface. And uh, the wavelength is basically smaller than the, surf uh, the surface roughness. We get a speckle pattern. I copied this image here from Wikipedia. It's an intensity image. So yeah, we have this constructive, destructive interferences. However, it's actually, it, it, it's a phase phenomenon. And so what does this mean for our ranging system? Let's look, has that, let's look again at our ranging spectrum. This is a well-behaved ranging spectrum. It has, you know, a nicely behaved uh, um, full width half max linked with the resolution or the optical bandwidth of the system. However, if you look at the time or the optical beat, I mean, you might have this nice behaved sinusoidal wave if it's, um, you sit on a bright speckle. However, speckles, they change with time, they change with wavelength. So if during one sweep we actually image or we sit between two, two speckles, we get phase variations. Those phase variations can maximum be plus minus pi. So instead of having a nice sinusoidal wave, we get some phase shifts. And then getting the FFT of those distorted sinus wave or phase shifted wave, we can get ranging peaks that split. They look like that. So this is what's happening. Then we dug a little further into the literature and we realized, oh yeah, white light and interferometry see similar stuff. So, and they provide us with an analytical model. So then we, we, started, we started simulating the analytical model, fitting it to our data, and that's the analytical model I give you. That is basically the distribution of range measurement. So what we did, we were scanning across this really flat surface, really slowly, for over 20 centimeters, and those are many, 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 many range measurements. And then we do the range distribution. So we get the distribution of all those measurements, shown down here, also in green, offset it to zero, just for clarity. So we have a certain peak up here. This peak here is dominated, as we also see in the formula, by the surface roughness, and also by the range resolution, by the delta r. And then we have the wings. Those wings here are due to the outliers those speckled face noise outliers. And because we only can have a plus minus pi um, phase shift, they're cropped. So they do not go on forever. They are linked to the resolution of our system. So one take home message here is maybe, yes, we have those strong outliers. However, if you look at the precision of our system, it's given by the full width half max up here. And that one is given by the surface roughness and the, also the optical bandwidth of the sweep. And it's still pretty darn high, even though we have those outliers. So those outliers are very apparent to the eye, but they do not really deteriorate much the range and precision achievable. We also want to do an experiment to see if that's really true, what we think. So we reduced the optical sweep by a factor 10. And this is shown here, per bandwidth here in my little cartoon. We sweep over one gigahertz instead of one terahertz. Then we scan across this really flat iron lapping plate, and we get the outliers. Now the outliers, because our optical bandwidth is a factor 10 smaller, the outliers get a factor 10 bigger, about one and a half millimeters. We also see that we have a little bit more fuss here than when we increase the bandwidth again to one terahertz, so the precision of the system, of a ranging system, is basically, I mean, it, it's the 
optical bandwidth divided by the signal to noise ratio. So you have less optical bandwidth, you also get a little less precision, you get more fuss, more noise on your measurements. And you see, I mean, it, it, it sticks. So it's a factor 10 in different optical bandwidth, a factor 10 in outlier peak height. So speckle noise is fundamental to all coherent laser ranging systems. And it can be solved by higher optical bandwidth. It can also be solved, for example, that you sit on a bright speckle or you have some angle. I mean, you, you look at your sister or your target from different angles. Or, I mean, I say it's a phase phenomenon, so you also your amplitude drop, so you can filter out return, returns or signal, signal that are weak return power because of speckle noise. And as I mentioned before, since this peak of the range distribution is given by the surface roughness, the precision of our system can still be really high. Next, we wanted to see how well does our system perform when you only get a few photons back. For that one here, we fixed our steering optics. We were ranging to a one bright speckle on a rough surface. And then we measure basically the ranging precision. That means just the fuss of those range measurements when we measure over a certain time. And we see that uh, for low return power, we basically follow short noise limitation. And here we have some saturation. We didn't really look into that. And also you see this in the signal to noise ratio of our range spectrum peak. Um, so at the attenuation, we did this artificially of 110 dB. We were just you know, reducing the output power. And that means we have 150, 150 photons coming back from the target. We still have a range in precision of less than 10 microns. Maybe you remember at the very beginning I was mentioning this 100 micron number. So we can live with very little photons coming back. And those measurements were taken at 10 meters out. To summarize the precision of our system or the uncertainty, here we, we looked into, I do not want to go too much into detail, yeah, our cone drifts. It's not fully locked, it drifts maybe by a hertz a minute. We have a couple of microns here adding our uncertainty budget. Then we have in the signal processing, we have some clock issues maybe, that also a couple of microns. Then we have some real path length drift. That was a lab measurement, a micron. Signal to noise limitation, three microns. Then our calibration from, you know, to actually really capture through the image. That was one of our bigger factors here, seven microns. Speckle induced phase noise doesn't contribute. I mean, it contributes, but it's less than this co co coordinate calibration. Um, this is fundamental in the system. We also have something else, which I call here speckle induced frequency noise. This is due that we have this, you know, we have a fast update rate. It's half a millisecond. And it's hard to have um, steering optics that step scans at half a millisecond. So we basically, we move slowly across our target while we take a measurement. And then this is due to the um, average speckle phase. We, we can actually, then we have some additional frequency noise. It has to do with the coherence length of speckles. You have a certain beam spot size. So if we move during one measurement more than half, full with half max or full, beam spot, we are going to get hit by speckle-induced frequency noise. I'm going to talk about that a little later on. FMCW also, I mean, has many advantages, but Doppler motion is a problem. So just as a calculation, if we move in the Z direction by less than 10 micrometers per second, the contribution isn't big. Um, a solution to that one is obviously you could average an upsweep and a downsweep in frequency and get rid of that error. But in general, at 10 meters out, we have an uncertainty budget of less than 10 microns. So pretty good. Next, we uh, applied a slightly different, different system here. It has a little more output power, slightly longer sample rate. We can only measure two meters out, but otherwise it's the same working principle. Uh, steering optics, 
beam expander. So we focused on with a beam diameter to 300 microns for, I think it was one of these squared. And the relay range is five centimeters. I assume you all are familiar with it. So the range where we can take, or the depth we can take a sharp image is twice this relay range. So it's, again, Gaussian optics. I mean, you focus down the beam, and then the beam expands again. And then since we are at NIST, we need to have something that's well characterized before we measure it. So we didn't start with this cross-section of the I-beams, but we actually machined a NIST step block, which has step height between 30 microns and a couple of millimeter step heights. And then we scan across this target again. And this is a sample, let me see. This is a sample 3D image. So it's a volumetric measurement again, and we measure the step heights between 30 microns and 10 millimeters with the same range precision. And this is a different system. It was a commercial system from Bridger Photonics. They do not add the second frequency comb laser, but they use some sort of etalon, I think it's a cell, to calibrate the laser sweep rate. The more interesting thing, what was the test for the flames? So we moved to see you to do some measurements there. So we used two different flames. The uh, flow rate was the same for both of them. The flame width, five centimeters, given by the burner, to both diffusion flames. And they can be told to up to half a meter. Acetylene, as shown here, uh, has a heat, higher heat release than methane, has a higher temperature of combustion, and has a smaller HC ratio. That means uh, more soot. So, oops. <laughs> um, we didn't place the nest slab block behind. Basically, it's here it's kind of hard to see where it is by eye, whereas in the cleaner burning methane flame, it's really easy to discern the nest step block. So, acetylene means we have more soot. That means more signal scattering and attenuation, and we have higher temperature, which means bigger laser ranging beam deflection. However, I mean, you could think, yeah, of course, you should uh, use the acetylene flame because it's, more, it's closer to a real world um, scenario. But acetylene gives us this black flakes, the suit. And we've been working in a different lab, not our lab, the lab at CU. So Eric and I, who sits there, we did a lot of cleaning, and people weren't too happy because, you know, we have an optical experiment going on, and we're producing those uh, suit. They weren't too happy about that. So this is why some of the measurements were mostly taken with the methane flame and not the acetylene flame. While ranging through flames, I mean, the first that comes to mind is, of course, it's a hot medium. The refractive index is going to change. We did some experiments just to corroborate that. And shown here, there was two meters out, some ranging measurements over some time. I only show a really short time window, but we were measuring actually over minutes. So before we switch any flames on, our ranging measurements are here. I mean, they're kind of quiet. Pink is for the methane flame. This dirty yellow is for the acetylene flame. As soon as we switch the flame on, we get some flame instability of range measurement drops. You can also find something like that in literature. After less than a second, we ca they kind of quiet down. They're still a little noisy, but the range measurements quiet down. So again, so it's one, millise one range measurement is one millisecond to remind you here. And the, they kind of settle down at the range of set of a couple of micrometers. So then you can go back to the literature and kind of say, OK, that, that's the burning temperature of my flame. I have width of my flame. And it actually sticks. So this 5 to 7 mi micrometer is really due to refractive index change when ranging through flames. Similarly, when we switch the flames off, our range measurement goes up to longer ranges, so distances again. However, we see here, it's still a little noisier than it was at the very beginning. This is due to some residual heat still coming off from the burner. 
And when we look at this section here, we see that the acetylene flame gives us bigger range outliers here, and it's noisier, which is to be expected from the higher temperature and more sooth in the flames. We also wanted to, to have an idea of what's the range in precision or the dis range distribution of that and what is causing this noisy range measurement in the C direction. So we did an experiment where we did not have any flames in our ranging setup. Again, here I only show a couple of seconds, but we were measuring over minutes. And then we look, offset here for clarity, we look at the range in distribution. Here we were sitting on a bright speckle, so we do not have the speckle face noise to start with. We look at the range distribution, and yes, it is, indeed, it is kind of Gaussian norm normally distributed, as to be expected. And we have some range precision taken as the 4 with half max of a couple of micrometers given by the ranging system. Next, we switched on the methane flame, and our ranging measurement gets noisy. It's noisy and we have some structure. We again do some range distribution, again over more than those three seconds I show here, and we see in the beginning, yeah, it still has this um, kind of nice behaving peak, but now we have the wings again coming up here. And this is due to the speckle face noise I talked about a couple slides back. So the flame here gives us lensing. The flame gives us beam deflection or beam steering. So we're going to move across this um, diffusely scattering surface. And we see speckle face noise coming up. That is kind of as to be expected. But then we wanted to know, is it really, is it really just, you know, the beam steering for the flame? So we were measuring what is the beam deflection in the case of, of the flame. And now, and then we can mimic the same beam steering across the surface with the steering optics. And this is what we got, the gray trace. It looks a little different, but if you look over minutes, the range distribution, it kind of follows pretty nicely the pink trace as measured with the methane flame. So yes, we can discern that the main noise source here is beam deflection given by the flames. Then we also looked at the range stability or precision, which is here I show uh, some Allen plots, if you're familiar with that. It's, I call it the range stability. In the absence of any flame, in the beginning, we can average down with one over square root time. So this is to be expected if we think of it of white noise. Then after a while, here the, our ranging instability is getting worse again. This is most probably due to some fiber drifts in the system. When we do the same in the case of a methane flame, in the beginning again, we average down. But then we have this distinct hump at 30 milliseconds. And then we average down a little bit, and then again our system drifts. So 30 milliseconds in the frequency domain means 10 hertz. And again, you can find that in the literature. It's any candle or fire is flickering. You have this kelvin helmholtz instability, which means you have some turbulences and some buoyancy who lifts up the flame. And so what we actually do in our ranging experiment, once we measure for the belly of the flame, and then due to this instability or the turbulence, we almost only measure through clean air. And this is at the, time, at the frame rate or time scale of 10 hertz. And we see it really nicely in our ranging stability measurements. In the case of an acetylene flame, again, more soothe, higher temperature, our ranging this uh, uncertainty gets worse. We also see a little bit of this hump here, but everything else, the uncertainty is, is kind of higher, which is to be expected with a higher temperature and more suit, as I mentioned before. So another take home message is, yes, everything gets worse in the case when we measure through those flames. However, we are still really precise. I mean, we are way below the 100 micrometers I was talking about before. And you can also think, I mean, it's 
you want to take one measurement or one 3D image in 100 seconds, for example. So we are even below 10 micrometers in order to do so. We also want to get yet a different hand on this laser beam deflection through flames. And this is also for scale-up experiments. You know, you need to have an idea what's going to happen if we finally go and do this in a more real-world scenario. So here we replace the target again by this focal plane indium gallium arsenide camera. We had to add some optical filter, otherwise the camera would be totally blinded by the flames. The frame rate of this camera was 60 hertz, lateral resolution 12 and a half micrometers. And then we look, how does the beam chitter in the X and the Y direction, not the C direction? We then look at the distribution. Here, X and Y are the um, on this focal plane array, and we get here on a logarithm scale those two blue traces. And they're roughly normally distributed, which makes sense. So we then can discern a maximum deflection angle of plus minus 0 0.75 milliradians, or with a standard deviation of 0 0.1 milliradians. So in this scenario, of course it's geometrics too, we have through a 5 centimeter flame, we have a range in precision of 5 micrometers. Again, way below this 100 micrometer number we want to hit. Finally, we were ready, because we have characterized our system quite a bit, to get some 3D images. So we placed an SSL block in the path, we measured one image, then we switched on the acetylene flame, we measured the other image. Would anybody like to tell me which one is which? On the right, surely, yes, on your left. Let's have a look. I mean, looking at those images, I couldn't say. <laughs> so, I mean, that was a good start. But, you know, looking more in detail, uh, we actually see that this guy here has more bad pixels more suit, more signal attenuation, but still it was less than 10% bad pixels compared to this image here. And we also have a decreased range in precision. Here I take the range in precision not on a single point, but I take kind of in the flat part. I see how flat is this region beneath the NIST logo. Here it's 30 microns as compared to 20 microns. 20 microns include not perfectly flat surface too. So still, we were happy with that. Then, as I say, the, the, the bigger picture is, you know, it's structural performance in the case of fire. So this is a method that maybe could, you know, help figure out how safe it is to be in a building. So it actually doesn't come to this problem here, you know, that we would, it was only a skeleton recovery. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so let's hope it doesn't get to that again. Huh? <laughs> so I mean, it, what we see here, we we can measure complex shapes through flames as well. We see the little foot here sticking out again. We have the false colored image, the rib cage, the skull, and yeah. So how about the forming objects? This is a kind of a trade-off between covered area, lateral resolution. By lateral resolution, I also mean, you know, we have those different steps. If they're really close, so maybe around here, if they're really close to each other, we need to hit them somehow. We, we, we need to be able to image them. If, if we space our measurements too far away, we won't capture them. And also precision. And here comes the frequency noise, or the frequency speckle noise into play. So first of all, we have a highly oversampled image. It's one million points. However, that only gives us a millihertz frame rate, but we have the highest precision possible given by the object itself. So here we space our measurement points very, very, very closely. What we could measure, however, for an image like that, it's not even that big. I mean, it's six centimeters times um, four centimeters. We could only measure a deformation of 0 0.5 millimeter per second. We then spaced our points, or measurement points, a little further away. 
which obviously increases the frame rate here to 100 millihertz, but it also decreases the range precision. This is due again to this that we have this steering optics that doesn't do steps that it, it basically scans continuously. Um, and here in this measurement, it's kind of, I always say, it's kind of amazing. This step here is 30 microns. Even though I measure range, range and precision of 100 microns around here, I still can kind of see the step size, but it's really getting hard to see it. However, also in this measurement, we could only measure 0 0.5 millimeters per second. So yeah, one solution would be we measure uh, something, you know, 10 centimeters or 50 centimeters, 50 centimeters in a really coarse range precision, and then zoom in to a feature that is really important to measure the structural performance, and then measure it at a really high res resolution. Or we could even take it a step further and not taking a 3D image at all. So, for example, we could just scan across again this I-beam section here. We could scan forward and backward across the section and see if that one deforms. Or, again, we are next. We need to have something that's well calibrated before we do the real measurement. We take our step block, and I say here, I said a line before, but we can actually do this L shape. So we could capture something that moves in the X direction and moves in the Y direction. And then we would, um, so we measure forward backward. We can increase the frame rate, the measurement rate a lot to one hertz here. In this experiment, we moved this block in the X direction, not the C direction, the X direction. We arbitrarily set X equals zero here, and we move this block at the velocity, constant velocity of 0 0.5 millimeter per second. So in the first measurement, when we scan across it once, we locate the step position um, at x minus 3 millimeters. When we scan back, we locate it here, and so on, and so on. So then since we know the update rate of our system, basically the measurement time, we plot the x location of the step as a function of measurement time. We can do some fitting, and we can extract a velocity of 0 dot five to seven millimeters per second with the error taken from the fit of five micrometers per second. So far so good. But how about real deforming objects? <laughs> so, you know, who doesn't like chocolate? We love chocolate, Eric, no? <laughs> it was good, we even had some during the experiment. And the experiment also liked to have some chocolate. We didn't eat it afterwards, that part. So we place a piece of chocolate of an own manufacturer here behind the flames and let it melt due to the radiation of the flames. We took then a video at an oblique angle of this melting chocolate and we also have now this 3D video taken by our FMCW later system. The videos are not synchronized in time, so here, bear with me, look at them. But both methods so can capture how the chocolate is collapsing. So here at an oblique angle, and this guy here through the flames taken by our system. So in this particular measurement, the chocolate it takes some time to melt, four minutes. The frame rate was 0 0.13 hertz, and each of those frames here is 7,500 pixels. The update rate of the system what we measured here is one kilohertz, which is not a funda fundamental limit. Since then, we upgraded the system to actually have four kilohertz update rate. So, what is next? Of course, we want to go and do a uh, I mean, real fire experiment. We can't do, that, uh, do this at the nest in Boulder, Colorado, because, you know, we need this personal protection equipment. You need the hard hat. You need to have the real lab to do that. So this is being done at the NIST in Gettysburg. What we did in the first experiment, we're looking at the beam deflection across a big burner. So each of those burners is a good 30 centimeters wide. So in total, we're going to have up to one meter of flames. It's methane in, um, in this case. 
So then, here's a blue laser. Different wavelengths than the radiation of the flames. We have here a screen because we need to protect the camera that sits here. And then we measure how the beam is chittering at, um, due to the flame. So the first flame we've seen is chittering. It now within the second uh, burner is chittering. It's even more. And then we have one meter of, uh, of flames. And then we get some beam attenuation, as you might have seen. So the frame rate in this experiment of the camera was 60 hertz, and the pixel spacing was 50 microns. We then look again um, at the beam deflection, or basically how does this pixel move on the camera due to those big flames. And we see in absence of any flames, it's pretty stable, as it should. We switch on the first burner, and the beam starts to chitter quite a bit. Then we switch, off a second, switch on the second burner, so 60 centimeters of flame. Still chittering. I mean, doesn't, I mean, maybe a little bit different, but not so much. Once we have one meter of flames, we get a lot of signal attenuation. This is why we have here some gaps. Then the burners were switched off. And again, we have some residual heat. But then the, the chittering is slowly, uh, slowly quiet down. So... What we see here in this experiment that the beam deflection is mostly given by the first flung of flames. So if you have 30 centimeters or 60 centimeters or up to a meter of flame, the beam chittering does not, I mean, it changes a little bit, but not significantly. We can also look at the distribution. Here I only show the X pixel, but the Y is pretty much the same in blue, and we see it's it's kind of hard to see, but the black rays, it's a Gaussian distribution, as to be expected. In pink here is um, the beam deflection in the, also the X plane shown for a 5 centimeter burner. So we then can go back to some um, geometrics, and we can calculate, yes, we're going to have a plus minus 2 milliradian um, beam deflection as compared to the 0 0.75 milliradian for the 5 centimeter burner. That one is for, I think I took some measurements in here, for the 60 to 100 meter of flames. And in here, obviously what we're also going to see is a slant of the target. So we can assume, I think it was at the time, a 5 to 10 <coughs> degree, you know, um, of um, a, a particular angle towards the laser beam. So from that one, we can estimate a range precision on a fixed point of the target of 35 micrometers for one meter of flames. However, do I mean to get the real ranging? I mean, well, what you also could do, I mean, as you see, we don't, do not have a real range offset. So to basically get a better ranging precision, we could time average some of those range measurements, which of course then will give us, uh, um, so, uh, sorry, it will take a little longer to get one measurement, but that's one possibility we could do. And as I wanted to say before, however, the real ranging experiments will tell the real story. This is just some pre preliminary scale-up experiments. So to summarize, I could show you, hopefully, that F and CW later can see through flames, that through an acetylene flame, we had a range in precision of 30 microns. It's fast enough to capture deforming structures. So we had some more chocolate from a different country, which we had to image as well. So, and I could also show you that we can live with very low return powers, which makes this promiseful. And we have some background rejection. This is mostly due to our heterodyne gain. It's a coherent measurement. We can measure complex shapes of objects with different reflectivity. And the ranging uncertainty through bigger flames, I mean, we still have to investigate what the real beam deflection is on the ranging beam and also what is the beam attenuation from suit. And with this, I thank you for coming. Thank you very much, Esther. Uh, questions?